Welcome, everyone, to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Glad to be here with you. My time for personal projects has been limited recently, so everything has gone on the back burner this summer and fall while I've worked on researching and writing a book. But the end is upon me, and I'm gearing up to start conducting interviews again in anticipation of 2018. One of the changes for the new year is that I've decided to organize the podcast into seasons, Starting mid-January and lasting until mid-April of 2018, I'll be running episodes of Most Notorious every week. Then in the fall, after a summer break, I'll be back with three more months of Most Notorious with week-to-week episodes. So keep subscribed and stay tuned. I've got lots of great true crime history topics coming up. My guest today is Mark Shaw, a former criminal defense attorney and author of over 20 books, including the one we're discussing today, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, The Mysterious Death of What's My Line Star and media icon Dorothy Kilgallen. It's especially topical, as you'll soon hear, because of the recent release of some of the John F. Kennedy assassination files. Thank you for your time today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Eric. So what is it about the story of Dorothy Kilgallen that led you to write a book about her life and death? Well, as an author yourself, you know, you know, I just just can't tell sometimes about uh, about books Um, when we're in the creative area and we we splice something on the pages there when we started with no words and then we end up with all these words and you don't really know what you have exactly and whether anybody will give a darn. But that's kind of the case with this one because I never really intended to write this book, Eric. Uh, mo- like most people, I remember Dorothy Kilgallen uh, as a star panelist on a game show called What's My Line. Uh, it was on CBS for 15 years every Sunday night. Uh, 20 million people watch that show. And for those who uh, will recall that show, or many young people um, who have um, found out about Dorothy and then gone to the reruns on the internet and all of that. It was kind of an intellectual game show where they brought on contestants, and Dorothy and uh, three other panelists would try to guess their unusual occupations. And uh, Dorothy was kind of the star. Uh, I have quotes about her calling her kind of like a prosecutor. She was, She played to win. And uh, Dorothy, at that time, had multiple careers. She had broke, broken the glass ceiling before we even knew about that. Uh, she was a college dropout and uh, went through all the wars with uh, gender discrimination and everything because back then a woman wasn't supposed to be in the back seat of the car. She was supposed to be in the car behind, and Dorothy didn't let that stop her. So she had a column in the New York Journal American uh, called um, Voice of Broadway that had Oh, some gossip, Broadway stuff, and yet she always touched on 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 crime because she had a real passion for that. Covered some criminal trials in New York City and all that. She was on the radio five days a week with her husband. A show listened to by by two by millions, and she had covered many of the of the uh, uh, most famous, really, or infamous trials of the 20th century. Doctor Sam Shepard. Um, that show or that uh, case uh, people will remember became The Fugitive, the, te- the, te- the film and the television uh, series. Uh, um, Harrison Ford uh, starred as, um, as in, that, in that program. Uh, she covered the Lindbergh baby kidnapping case, um, many others. And so she had this other side to her, but I didn't know anything about that. Well, uh, in 2007, I published a book called Melvin Belli, King of the Courtroom. And uh, many people will remember he was probably the most famous lawyer of the 20th century. He represented the Rolling Stones and Tammy Faye Baker and a lot of celebrities. His main client, though, was Mickey Cohen, who was a Los Angeles gangster. And so I knew Mr. Belli in the 80s. I practiced law in his building, and he and I got to be friends. And so when he died, I decided to write this biography, Eric, of him. Well, um, you know, I learned about Belli's representation of Ruby and his mafia affiliations, and so I got some question marks in my mind about that representation of Ruby, whether uh, it was compromised, he used an insanity defense that didn't make much sense, and Ruby was sentenced to, to death and all of that. So I wrote the book about Belli, and then I put that aside, and I decided then to write another book called The Poison Patriarch, which chronicled 
uh, my belief that Joe Kennedy, the patriarch of the of the Kennedy family, uh, was somehow or another uh, connected more to JFK's death than many people thought. And so I went back to 60 election. And as you remember, uh, the, J- uh, Joe thought that JFK was going to lose that election, and he made a deal with the devil, uh, with the, the mobsters, um, Sam Giancana, Carlos Marcello, Santo Traficante, all these guys, that if they helped him win Chicago and, and Illinois, then when they got in the White House, they'd leave those guys alone. Well, Bobby Kennedy was appointed attorney general. I had a primary witness who was right there when that happened. And Bobby went after those guys. And as you know, you can't mess around uh, with those dangerous types. And so in the Poison Patriarch, I concluded that basically, um, you know, one of those mobsters, Carlos Marcello, uh, had uh, decided that he couldn't put up with Bobby anymore. And so Bobby was deporting him. Bobby was uh, charged him with conspiracy in a New Orleans court. And so my theory there was that what uh, Marcello decided was, look, uh, we can't kill Bobby Kennedy because Jack Kennedy will come after us with everything the government has. So we kill Bobby, we kill Jack Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy is powerless. And that's exactly what happened. They never bothered those guys again. So that was it for me. I was done. And yet I'm a curious guy like you are, Eric. And during my research for the Mel- Melvin Belli book, I interviewed a doctor friend of Belli's down in San Diego. And we talked about Bell Eye and everything like that. And at some point during that conversation, he said, you know, he knew Dorothy Kilgallen. And I said, you mean he was on What's My Line? He said, oh, Mark, you don't know anything about her. And he spilled out all this information that I just gave you about her multiple careers. And he said, you know, I have to tell you, when Dorothy died, Mel said to me, they've killed Dorothy. Now they'll go after Jack Ruby. And I could never get that quote out of my mind. They've killed Dorothy. Now they'll go after Jack Ruby. And that's what triggered uh, my writing this book. So, so I'd love to step back for just a minute and talk more about Dorothy Kilgallen and her early life. She was really an amazing woman. And, and it's just a shame that more people don't know who she is. In your book, you compare her in her day to Oprah Winfrey now, a, a truly iconic female figure. So how did she get started as a reporter? Uh, can, can I ask you that? Sure. Well, thank you for saying that about Dorothy, because uh, uh, you may have read in the epilogue that I think Dorothy guided me along uh, all the way with this book. I think she chose me to write it. Uh, some people think I'm crazy, but many times when I was going to give up or, or wanted more information, I felt like Dorothy was just send me sending me in a certain direction. So I feel like today she's probably listening to this, and and she'll appreciate your comment. She was an amazing woman. You know, Ernest Hemingway called her the greatest female writer in the world. The New York Post said she was the most powerful female voice in America. Um, You you know, the the, uh, the honors just go on. She was a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist. Well, how did that happen, This, this young girl who was born in Chicago, before her, her father, who was a celebrated journalist in, in himself, moved the family to New York City. And he worked for the Journal American. It wasn't called that at the time, but Journal American. And, and Dorothy just, you know, was in his, in, his, in his way all the time. She wanted to go down there to the, to the uh, office and all of that. She tried college and she dropped out. So there's an inspirational situation. You don't always need that four years uh, of education. And uh, she just became uh, kind of a newsroom brat. Well, finally, uh, her father uh, talked the, uh, one of the editors into giving her kind of like an internship, we would call it now. And she started in. And at first, it didn't work out. And then she started writing these articles. And everybody in the newsroom was just amazing. And especially, she liked to go to the local courtrooms. And they let her do that. And so she covered a few trials there and all of that and wrote about them. And she started to get some notoriety a bit. Uh, and then uh, all at once they came, they said, look, we, we'd like you to try something else. We need somebody to report on Broadway, on on the um, entertainment business, films, all of that. And she said, well, I don't know if that's for me. And they said, well, look, you can also include material about politicians, trials, whatever you want to. And so that became the column Voice of Broadway. Hearst Corporation was the publisher of uh, the Journal American. And they syndicated that column to 200 newspapers across the country. And Dorothy just became 
this media icon, a powerful woman, like the New York Post said. She could make or break a career in that column of hers, Eric. It was it was something people read every day to get their news. And remember, we're talking about a time in the 50s and 60s when there, when there was no Internet, uh, television was in its infancy, and where did people get their news? They got it from the newspapers, magazines too, but mostly from the newspaper. So she was this goddess of... of uh, of uh you know the media at that time and one thing that really stuck out with her and i think this answers your question she really got a reputation for integrity you know this book has become a bestseller and i'm so pleased that people around the world have sent me emails 500 and some at the last count talking about dorothy and the integrity that she had she was a woman of the truth she didn't make up news there wasn't any fake news like today where some newsman comes up with a conclusion or an author comes up with a conclusion and then fits the facts to that. She was the other way around for Dorothy. She got her facts and then she either provided a conclusion or made her readers stop and think. And that was such a big deal. And how many people, Eric, have said to me, I wish we had reporters like Dorothy Kilgallen today. So uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing story in many ways. Very inspiring. Many young journalists have told me about that. And then to go just one step further, uh, I don't know why the national media ignores Dorothy. Even just recently, when the JFK files were released, I couldn't even watch some of these programs where they had so-called experts about the JFK assassination on, because there's one thing that separates Dorothy Kilgallen from everybody else about uh, the JFK assassination. None of these so-called experts these authors, me included, we weren't there. And as you may know from, from reading the book and looking at the videos and everything that are up on the Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org, Dorothy was there. She was at the Jack Ruby trial. She was the only uh, reporter to interview Jack Ruby. She released his Warren Commission testimony before it was to be released. She is the expert. And I'm her voice. And yet, uh, Dorothy is not included in the discussion somewhere or another, and that's very sad because I believe her investigation was the most compelling in history. I'll admit, for a period in my life, I was a little obsessed with Nellie Bly, the groundbreaking female journalist from the turn of the century. And she wrote an incredible expose after she disguised herself as a mental patient and entered an insane asylum. It's interesting that one of the things Nellie Bly did as a young journalist is to take a trip around the world and document it for her paper. And and Dorothy Kilgallen followed in her footsteps, right? Dorothy did. Yes, Dorothy did. Yeah, both of them did. Yes. Yeah, there's there's another uh, situation. And again, you have to you have to recall uh, there's some a great photo of Dorothy. She looks like she's about 15 years old. But they had this race around the world, and uh, Nellie Bly, I think, was a hero of, of hers. And uh, when they said there's going to be a reporter from the New York Times and another reporter, both men, and she just scurried right into her editors at the Journal American and said, I can do that. And they said, Dorothy, come on. And so finally they convinced her. She went out and got you know a, a quick wardrobe and got a visa and got everything and she took this trip around the world and at that time it doesn't seem like a big time to, a big deal today eric but they used commercial aircraft and and she traveled the world you know and they had this race and she didn't win but she came in second and she, you know she got letters from eleanor roosevelt and everyone else praising um you know her gumption in and even getting involved in that race and then how well that she did and as you may know they ended up making a film called fly baby fly based on a book that dorothy wrote and she's still just you know i think she's still in her in her 20s or whatever and 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 it's just amazing that she was able to accomplish that but there's some good comparisons there with uh with nelly Bly. so for a lot of us our connection to dorothy kilgallen is what's my line Fortunately, there are a lot of episodes of these shows available on on sites like YouTube where we can experience her wit and charm for ourselves. And that television show, even if it was the only thing she'd ever done, would still have been a great legacy. For those who aren't aware of this this classic television show, could you explain the premise and, and what it did for her career? 
Well, uh, Bob Bach was an assistant uh, producer in the CBS uh, regime, and and they somehow or another they they saw a show that was kind of like this, and and uh, he came up with the idea, and he became a very good friend of Dorothy's, and um, they decided to do this show. Well, she had some fame uh, through her columns and everything else, so she was kind of a natural, and she became one panelist. Arlene Francis was a Broadway actress of some acclaim and very beautiful and you know both she and Dorothy were fashion plates wearing these Fifth Avenue uh, latest fashions and all of that and then Bennett Cerf was an interesting addition every week because he was the co-founder of Random House and that of course plays into Dorothy Kilgallen because at, at one point after she had completed a great deal of her JFK assassination investigation Random House hired her to write a book about what she was finding uh, with the assassination and other matters called Murder One. So those were the three staples uh, every week. John Daly, uh, John Charles Daly was the um, was the uh, host and uh, rather you know staid type of guy. He you know wasn't uh, he didn't let himself um, go too much. But every once in a while you know they could get some good laughter from him. But he kind of ran the show. And then they had a celebrity guest, uh, a guest panelist every week. And that could range from a Tony Randall to, um, oh, you know, there were many people that were on there, Jimmy Durante. There was all kinds of, of, of stars from stage and screen who were there. And those four sat there, and then uh, a woman, w- a man or woman, would come, be introduced by John Charles Daly. And, in fact, Catherine Stone, who basically was one of the last people to see Dorothy Kilgallen alive, uh, on the last night of her life, uh, for instance, she, her occupation was she sold dynamite. And so they would bring her out, and then back then it was a big deal. If they, didn't, uh, if they, if they got a no uh, from one of their questions, they would give the contestant $5. And uh, they had uh, 10 tries and then $50, and then they would announce who it was. Uh, every once in a while, they would have a, a mystery uh, celebrity uh, come on, and uh, the panel would be blindfolded, and they would try to guess who that celebrity was. And so that was another fun part of the show. And it just clicked with everybody. And uh, Dorothy, again, was the, the kind of the headliner, but uh, all of them contributed to that successful show. She was so, so popular, and you give a great example of her popularity in your book. When she went to cover some of these famous trials, it wasn't the, the criminal that was the center of attention, but it was her wasn't it? Oh, I love the I love the photograph of her on the cover of the book, which she's right at a typewriter there, because that's who Dorothy was, and people can take a look because you'll see all the pearls on her wrists and around her neck, and she's got this, you know, hairdo, and you know she's serious as can be. But my real favorite photograph, and again, I would tell people to to learn more about Dorothy in the book and everything associated with her, all of the uh, quotes about her, her columns. Um, you know, uh, the uh, interviews, videotaped interviews with her closest friends, and all of that are up on the DorothyKilgallenStory.org. That's where people can go to learn more about it. But my favorite photograph is up there, and she's at the Dr. Sam Shepard case, and she's standing in the middle of a bevy of reporters, and they are all looking at Dorothy. And that's the kind of respect she had. She kind of, uh, it was interesting too, Eric, you can imagine. Yeah, she had a gossip column on the one hand, and yet she was this uh, revered investigative reporter on the other, and she could mix those two careers and still have the respect of her colleagues. So uh, if people take a look at that photo, they will see the admiration for her that was there. She's just a remarkable uh, woman, and um, I'm pleased that, 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 you know, the book has done so well, and so so many people have learned more about her. I'm writing a follow-up book, and, and, and I'm going to, you know, be able to provide more information about her all, all across the way with her life, death, all of that. And the paperback just came out this week, too, with a little more information about Dorothy. But I hope that more people, and I'm going to keep trying, will learn about Dorothy because, um I don't think there's anybody uh, that can touch her in, in in being a media icon. She was doing it all, uh, but she loved to be able to cover those trials, that's for sure. And judges would actually call her into their chambers for autographs. Oh, yes. And, and you know, you could take uh, the, the, the judge in the, in the Jack Ruby trial. I mean... Uh, 
he's he's the one who uh, you know when she got there she was hanging around with Melvin Belli and his co-counsel uh Joe Tonahill and of course um on the website there you can learn about how the interviews came up with Jack Ruby the only ones he ever gave to a reporter there at that trial but uh the judge uh, first thing he did is call her into his chambers and get her to stand there um with a uh, with him for a photograph but the the most compelling one about that is at the Sam Shepard case and as people may remember he was a uh, noted uh, surgeon i believe and uh his wife died at their home and he was supposed to have uh, killed her uh people may remember there was the one arm bandit that um uh, that uh, was so uh, you know prominent in the television series and the film but um, during that trial, uh, jo- uh, Dorothy did not uh, believe uh, that uh, the prosecution had proven um, uh, Shepard guilty. Well, the judge called her in before you know before the trial, and she sat there with him, and he said, uh, "Dorothy, what in the world are you doing here at this trial?" And she said, "Well, it's got all the aspects of a of a great story. You know, it's a famous uh, surgeon." There's a mysterious, um, uh, you know, death here and all of that. And he said, what do you mean? He's guilty as hell. And Dorothy just kind of took that comment in. And so they had a little more of a discussion. Well, Dorothy was very um, secretive with regard to her sources and um, believed that that conversation was really uh, between uh, the judge and, and her. And so... She didn't say anything about it. She had a thick uh, JFK assassination file that she had kept, and she made a note in there about that. But then Sam Shepard was convicted, and uh, she didn't say anything through all of that and the trial at the end, although she blasted the verdict in in columns and things. But then about a year later, I believe it is, Eric, I may be wrong in the time frame, but uh, the judge died. And Ethelie Bailey, who was uh, the uh, appellate counsel for uh, for uh, Sam Shepard, who, who I happen to know uh, and practice law with a little bit in the in the 80s, um, ran into Dorothy, and Dorothy said, "Hey, I need to talk to you." And she told him about what the judge had said. Well, obviously, that's judicial bias. And uh, Lee Bailey, uh, you know, uh, admits, of course, that when they filed the appeal with the Supreme Court. And Dorothy's comments were in there about what the judge said, that that was the compelling reason why the conviction was overturned. Now, later, um, Shepard was uh, acquitted of the murder, but you can imagine then the power that she had there. And uh, the fact that uh, because uh, Dorothy Kilgallen um, had said this judge was way out of line with that judicial uh, bias. That's why a conviction was overturned by nothing less than the Supreme Court of the United States. This column was incredibly powerful, powerful enough to, to make some enemies, including Frank Sinatra, right? Yeah, the, the book is set up as a true crime murder mystery, um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, we've, we've uh, been engaged by a production company in L.A. to to... Uh, produce a television series based on the book, and it'll be set up the same way the book is. You learn about Dorothy Kilgallen if you didn't know anything about her. Then you learn that she had a personal interest in um, investigating the JFK assassination, and then she uh, mysteriously dies, and then we find out what the official uh, reason was supposedly for that, and then the new evidence that I uncovered that points toward murder, and then we have uh, at least five, I think, maybe six suspects that I lay out like a prosecutor would lay them out to a jury. And uh, they, they range from her husband, Richard, to Carlos Marcello, to J. Edgar Hoover, who hated her, Dorothy because she um, you know, was, uh, was shouting out the fact that his Oswald alone theory made no sense. But one of the most interesting to people in there has been um, Frank Sinatra. Well, uh, she and Dorothy were good friends. Uh, she and uh, Sinatra and Dorothy were good friends at one point, but... Uh, she wrote a few columns about uh, Sinatra's girlfriends, calling them bimbos and has-beens and all of this and how he would take them to bed and then dump them and everything. Well, he didn't like that. So he uh, started calling her the chinless wonder. If you look at a photograph of Dorothy, she has a little bit of a receding chin, and so he picked on that. He also sent her a fake uh, tombstone to her office. And, of course, what did that what, what did that uh, trigger? Well, she wrote more... <laughs> unkind columns about Sinatra. So 
uh, that was one of the main enemies that Dorothy had. And uh, as you may recall, when when uh, Sinatra found out that Dorothy died, uh, he was standing there and he told his agent, well, gosh, uh, I guess I'll have to change my act because every night when he appeared in New York City, uh, he would make fun of Dorothy. He would uh, use a, um, a keychain, a key, to show that was what her figure looked like. Uh, he would take up a, um, uh, a uh, you know, ask people to give them, give him money so that they could buy Dorothy a new chin. So the two of them were really, uh, you know, on either side of a, of a real uh, strong uh, hatred relationship at the time, and. Um, of course, uh, Sinatra had enough, uh, you know, had enough um, contacts uh, in the underworld and otherwise that he could have obviously silenced uh, Dorothy if he wanted to. Wow. So I'd love to talk more about the Kennedy assassination with you. But before we do that, I want to ask you about her experience with President Kennedy. She brings her son to the Oval Office and is actually able to spend some time with him, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting what happens in people's lives. Um, I'm sure you're the same way as I am. There are these defining moments. And the one for me is uh, Dorothy knew uh, JFK personally. He had been to her home. They played charades there. Uh, he saw her at, a, at the Stork Club, which is a, which is a very famous uh, nightclub in New York City. But at one point, uh, she took her youngest son, Kerry, who was in third grade at the time, to the White House. And Pierre Salinger set up a tour for them. And they were in the presidential library, and all at once JFK came in. And he embraced Dorothy, and then he just made the biggest fuss over Kerry. He gave him a PT-109 pin for his lapel. He looked at some letters that Doroth- that uh, the little boy had brought from his third grade class, especially one of them that Kerry had written, and it just overwhelmed Dorothy. And she never forgot that. And that was a real defining moment because um, when JFK was killed uh, and, and uh, you know, Dorothy was a, a person who really, um, you know, she really uh, questioned everything. She's a very curious uh, person. And so when JFK died, she was very dubious right away of what happened. She didn't buy the Oswald thing. It just seemed too convenient. And uh, so she sat there and watched that, and and she knew right away that she was going to look into her friend's death, JFK's death. And then, of course, when Ruby shot Oswald, that made no sense to her whatsoever. And so that was a defining moment when she was at the White House, and that's what launched this 18-month investigation of hers. She had the best sources in the country because she had that bully pulpit with the column and her articles and all of that. So right away, she went to her sources at the Dallas Police Department and in Dallas and New Orleans, where Marcello was and all of this. And then, of course, she ends up at the Jack Ruby trial. What's so incredible about this whole thing, and it's hard to imagine now, especially with the the vast number of books about the assassination available, loads of different conspiracy theories, etc. But at the time, there was no one really questioning the Warren Commission's results except for her, right? She she was the lone public voice. Well, uh, no question about it. Uh, she just didn't buy all that. You know, Hoover was out there shouting Oswald alone, Oswald alone, and so, and and people have asked me why. Well, uh, here's why. He, he was he was a smart man. He was trying to protect himself. If it's a nut like Oswald, then uh, nobody could have prevented it. But if it's uh, anybody in the in the government or in in the mafia or anything else, then he can have responsibility. And uh, I will just switch gears just for a second because these um, JFK files that were released, at least part of them, uh, a week or so ago, there is a very compelling uh, uh, November 24th, 1963 document in there, uh, FBI document, and it basically says that um, Hoover has ordered uh, the fact that the American public should be convinced that Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin, the only assassin. And that's, that was his program. That was what Hoover was shouting out. Well, here comes along Dorothy Kilgallen. Seven days after J- JFK was died, she writes this column, and you can read it on the DorothyKilgallenStory.org, the Oswald file must not close. And she just goes through all of this about how little sense any of that makes. And then she just continues writing all these articles, that uh, scathing articles, questioning everything that's going on, 
Uh, and, you know, she has the best information of anybody out there. And nobody else is uh, going in the direction that Dorothy is because Hoover has sent all of the journalists, anybody, an American public, everybody in the world, on the Oswald Alone Trail, which Dorothy believed was a dead end, as I do, because Oswald's too confusing. There's too many speculation possibilities out there and everything else. So she didn't focus on Oswald. She focused on Jack Ruby, and that's why she got those two interviews with him. Uh, then she used her sources to get his testimony before the Warren Commission, Eric. And you have to imagine what a big deal that was when she published it. It was like you know, publishing the Pentagon Papers or uh, the NSA documents or, the, you know, the Nixon tapes, anything like that. That was a huge, uh, you know, uh, deal at that particular time. And, of course, that infuriated uh, J. Edgar Hoover as well because he was in charge of all the, all the goings-on with the Warren Commission. So, uh, yeah, she was the lone voice. And uh, today she still is the lone voice, and yet... Uh, that voice it isn't heard as much as uh, as it should be. She, she was there when Jack Ruby murdered Lee Harvey Oswald, what, wasn't she? No, she wasn't there in Dallas at, on that particular day, but, but she was there shortly thereafter because that made no sense to her whatsoever. Uh, that was too convenient, and, and she started learning about Ruby and his connections with the police department and, uh, you know, all of the other aspects of his relationship with... Um, uh, with with mobsters. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't think there's any question in my mind, and I think it's been proven by the new evidence that I put together, that Dorothy had connected uh, Ruby with Oswald and with Carlos Marcello, the, the, uh, the, the one the, the mafia who had the most reason to kill JFK so Bobby would be powerless. And you have to remember, after she interviewed Ruby, where did she go? She didn't go back to Dallas. She didn't stay there to look into JF, uh, to LBJ or any of that. She didn't go to Washington, D.C. to look into the CIA. She went to New Orleans, a very uh, a trip that she talked to about her, uh, to her two hairdressers, who, her closest friends, who uh, their videotaped interviews are on the DorothyKilgallenStory.org. Uh, she told one of them, I'm afraid for my life and my family. She told the other one, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. And this is shortly after she was in New Orleans. So Dorothy, I believe, really felt like the JFK assassination was a mafia hit start to finish. The motive was there for Marcello to do this. His empire stretched from New Orleans to uh, Dallas. I mean, she had it all figured out. There was no real conspiracy in her mind. It was just, hey, here's a common sense mafia hit. You you get to a point where you, you've got to get rid of somebody who's uh, persecuting you, or at least you think he is, so you kill JFK so Bobby is powerless. And that's what Dorothy was going to write in her book uh, for Random House. Uh, you know, she was completing that book uh, when she was found dead in her uh, Manhattan townhouse on November 8, uh, 1965. So I'd appreciate it if you could talk about the last hours of her life what happened and how she was eventually found well you you have to think uh after she was in new orleans she was going again uh she had found some information there she'd found a source and so she was getting ready to go back there and uh you know uh dorothy was scared as i just said through the two statements that i mentioned you know she had bought a gun she was going to change her will she was telling she was a blabbermouth Dorothy thought she was invincible. She was telling everybody, you know, she's going to crack this case wide open. It's the trial. It's the case of a lifetime. You know, I'm going to uh, basically told one hairdresser, I'm going to prove who killed the president and why. So she set herself up as a target. And all these enemies are circling, circling with all of them having motive to get rid of her. So she comes back to New York City and she's working on her book and she's getting ready uh, to go back to New Orleans, and um, on the last night of her life, uh, she gets a telephone call at her apartment, and it's from this guy that she's been uh, dating, so to speak. Dorothy was married, but she'd had an affair or two, and so this guy, who was a journalist in Columbus, Ohio, had become a friend of hers and a lover. And uh, we believe that she got a phone call from him asking whether they could meet later that night because Dorothy suspected that this journalist, Ron Pataki, was leaking her JFK assassination information to the wrong people. 
out of this file that she carried with her all the time. So uh, she goes to What's My Line, and she performs there. She guesses that uh, uh, occupation of the woman who sold dynamite. She then goes to a, a bar called P.J. Clark's in New York City that's still there today. And I've sat right next to the table where Dorothy sat that night. And then she goes to the Regency Hotel uh, and goes to a bar there for where there's a party going on with the contestants of What's My Line, including this Catherine Stone, the dynamite woman. And she sees, Catherine does, Dorothy in the corner with this man, uh, who we believe is Ron Pataki. Uh, and uh, they're talking very seriously about things. And then Dorothy, uh, at some point, disappears from the... Uh, hotel. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, how she got home, but at some particular point then she does. Uh, I think the proof in the book, uh, basically the, uh, especially the forensic evidence, you know, they said she, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the forensic evidence, uh, we believe, shows that at some point uh, her, her drink there at the Regency Hotel or at home was spiked with uh, barbiturates. Uh, somehow or another that happens, and then uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, the next day on the uh, 8th, uh, hairdresser Mark Sinclair comes over to fix her hair for, a, for a, a, a meeting she has at Carey's school. And he goes into a bedroom on the third floor that she never sleeps in, finds her in a bed she never slept in when she did sleep there. And Dorothy has on her uh, eyelashes, her fake eyelashes, uh, hairpiece and makeup that she never wore to bed. There is a, uh, a book lying or laying, whichever it is, on her lap upside down that she's already read. Her reading glasses aren't around. And, you know, common sense would say this is a, a staged death scene. Well, they finally call the authorities. And I do have some new evidence about that we can talk about in a minute. But the authorities come. The medical examiner is called not from the Manhattan branch but from the uh, Brooklyn branch. Uh, which is known to have mafia control. I've, I've had eyewitnesses in the book who were right there that talk about how much that, that was going on. And uh, right away, this uh, medical examiner sees an empty bottle of Secanol, which is sleeping pills, on a bedside table. And one thing leads to another. He does this autopsy, and he decides that she died of a combination of barbiturates and alcohol intake. Um, unfortunately, that uh, verdict is just accepted by everybody, uh, despite the fact that Dorothy didn't have any uh, drug problems or wasn't an alcoholic of any kind. There is absolutely no investigation of any kind, Eric. The case is basically closed, and um, until uh, there is some information in a, in a book that was written in the 1970s, and then what I have uncovered and and, uh, and and produced in this particular book, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen was basically buried. Uh, the killers won, in my opinion, because she was just absolutely silenced and uh, never heard of uh, for 50-some for years, basically. It's similar in some ways to the death of Marilyn Monroe, isn't it? There, there are those similarities. There's some differences, but there are similarities. The problem with uh, the investigations into into Marilyn Monroe's uh, death, uh, and I don't believe there's any connection between the two that I have discovered. I, I'm a big primary source guy like you are. I want to I get the truth right from the person, not uh, five people who say somebody said something. And that's kind of what happens with Marilyn's case. Uh, the investigators came there. They botched the crime scene. Plus, there isn't a lot of primary source evidence about uh, her movements during the last uh, days of her life. Uh, there is some new information in the JFK files about her romance with Bobby Kennedy, but again, that's kind of speculation. With Dorothy, you, you've got these uh, these uh, people who were there, uh, the two um, hairdressers. Uh, you've got the uh, woman that last saw her, and then, uh, God love them, uh, readers who read this book from all over the place have contacted me, and all of this new evidence has come to me. Uh, that I've um, some of it in the um, in the paperback book that just came out, and then some will be in the new book that comes out next year. Uh, really, uh, first-hand information about more things that happened uh, with Dorothy uh, during those last days of her life. Interesting. So, so you write in your book that there are three possibilities for the cause of her death. She might have died of an accidental drug overdose. She might have committed suicide, and she might have been murdered. You've already mentioned she didn't abuse alcohol she, and she didn't take drugs. 
What was her mental state? Is it a possibility that suicide was something she was contemplating? Well, Dorothy was Catholic, and most people have said that wouldn't have happened because of uh, you know the religious ban on that kind of thing. But she had everything going for her. It made no sense whatsoever. Uh, she had a movie that they were going to make based on uh, the book she was writing. She was at the top of her uh, you know, performing life. Uh, she was, uh, what's my line was still a huge hit, the radio show. She just had everything going for, her. she loved her children so much. I mean, that's just absurd that anything like that, uh, would have happened. Accidental death. Um, there are toxicologists, uh, including Dr. Michael Baden, who looked at the, uh, fresh tests of Dorothy's uh, bodily fluids in 1968 and looked at those and said, wait a minute, there's makes no sense. Uh, the uh, barbiturates sound, uh, found in her uh, system, uh, there were three of them that they found, not just secanol in her system, uh, that were very dangerous barbiturates, and, and the impact of those uh, would have never, they would never have been taken accidentally. Um, there was some powdered form, which meant that somebody had undone the, uh, the capsules, and, and so the powder form was there. So there's all sorts of evidence that has to do with accidental death doesn't make any sense. And then you get to murder, of course, and, you know, I don't think there's any question that with the uh, suspects that I've presented and, and all of that um, and, the, and the motives involved that Dorothy Kilgallen had to be silenced, the worst form of censorship. Uh, Marcello and uh, Hoffa, or excuse me, um, Hoover and those kinds of people, they couldn't let her write that book. She, got, she was going to name names, and I believe there would have been a grand jury investigation, and then that brings me to something important here, Eric. I think that the course of history would have been changed if Dorothy Kilgallen had lived. Uh, she was the most you know, credible reporter at the time, had that respect, and here she is. She writes this book, and I believe that would have triggered a grand jury investigation, and just think about that. Uh, we really would have gotten an awful lot of answers about what happened then. Now, everybody wouldn't have had to have believed her, but uh, just think how um, that would have changed things. And what bothers me now is that, that some of the national media uh, still won't uh, focus on Dorothy Kilgallen. So we have the continuing distortion of history that happened back in 1965. So, so again, in your book, you ably document the, the various suspects who might have killed her. And you've talked a bit about each one of them. I'd like to ask you about Ron Pataki again. He's kind of a, a special suspect in the sense that you were actually able to interview him, right? Can you talk about what that experience was like, uh, meeting him face-to-face? It's a fascinating story. Well, I think, uh, you know, anytime you're, you're an author and, and you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to uh, expose the fact that there's a main suspect in a case. Uh, in 1970, the 70s, when there was a book written, they called him the out-of-towner. Uh, they didn't want to print his name, but I felt like, I found the interviews with him by a couple other journalists uh, that were very confusing and very conflicting, and I felt like that I wanted to myself see if Ron would talk to me. He very conveniently came into Dorothy's death just about the time that she was involved in the JFK assassination, and they did become lovers despite what he says. She loved him very much. She had a bad marriage with her husband who'd become an alcoholic, and um, so she trusted him, and a few times... Um, you know, I wondered about all that, and so I basically uh, contacted Ron through his website, and I said, I'd like to talk to you. Well, he not only talked to me once, but twice, and I think a third time. And uh, in one of those uh, interviews, I uh, audio taped it with his permission, and basically Ron was just all over the board with regard to the things that he told me, uh, where he was on the day she died, uh, conflicting account, how he found out about her death. Um, whether she really shared um, JFK assassination information with him about her, what she was, what she had in her file. Uh, one time he would say, "I didn't have it," and the next time he'd say, "Yes, she trusted me with that. I helped her with a, with a column headline having to do with Jack Ruby." So there were all these question marks, and it was interesting talking to him because, as a former criminal defense lawyer. Um, if I had been advising Ron, I would have said, Ron, keep your mouth shut. But I think he wanted to tell me these things. I felt like Ron kind of wanted to get a lot of this off his chest. And so uh, he provided me with all that information. Uh, I told him it was going to be in the book. When the book was released, I sent him a book. And and uh, I never heard from him. Uh, people asked me whether he was going to sue me or not. 
And I said, I very much doubt it because I don't think Ron Pataki would want to get himself in a courtroom. Uh, just as the paperback was coming out uh, last week, I uh, emailed him again. And I said, Ron, uh, you probably read the book and you know what I've written. If, if you want to talk to me again, I'd like to interview you. I sent a backup email just to make sure that he got it and told him that. And I said, I know you know what happened to Dorothy Kilgallen. Whether you were directly involved or not, I don't know. But I know you know what happened. Come on, for Dorothy's sake, talk to me about this. And I have not received any uh, any uh, response to those two emails because I want to give everybody a fair shake. Uh, but at some point, uh, I believe through you know uh, continuing an investigation into this, Ron is going to have to answer uh, for his conduct uh, back in 1965. He's 82 years old, lives in Ohio now, and uh, he's still around. And uh, I'm going to keep after him. And there was a point where Pataki f- fancied himself a bit of a poet, right? Yeah, oh, he wrote yes, a couple yes. of really bizarre and incriminating poems. Well, you know, I, what I said to people is, you know, you, I, I want my books like you do to make people stop and think. So I don't tell them what to do. I just present all the facts and then they can make up their mind. And this book has just really touched people's emotions for whatever reason. they concerned about what happened to Dorothy and that she was denied justice back in... 1965 and and all of that and and you know um when they when they've asked me about ron pataki in in all these emails and everything i say just go look at the poems well he wrote two and uh one of them uh was uh, having to do with uh you know basically silencing someone at a typewriter um you know keeping her mouth shut making her mouth shut all right well, that was one of them and that was strong evidence that it had to be about Dorothy. What else could it be about? The other one, though, was even more um, compelling, I suppose you could say, or more incriminating, and that had to do with, uh, I think it has to do, there, he's got a little cartoon with it of a bartender behind a, a, a bar, at a, at a, it looks like it, a, it could be at a nightclub or something, and it's all about poisoning a drink. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination to believe since three barbiturates, not one, were found in Dorothy's uh, stomach that somebody, um, you know, injected those barbiturates into her favorite drink, a gin and tonic, which uh, the tonic then would cover up the the, the uh, taste of those barbiturates. And um, I don't have any question in my own mind, and most readers don't, of believing that those two poems relate to Dorothy. Now, he said they were supposed to be humorous, told me that. And I said, come on, Ron, nobody's going to believe that. And he said, well, I just wrote them for fun. And I said, oh, come on. So um, that's a real compelling reason as to why I think he's the chief suspect in Dorothy's death. And, um, you know, uh, like I say, one of these days he's going he's gonna to have to uh, answer for what happened back then. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about the, the current investigation by the New York District Attorney's Office. And the catalyst for the reopening of this case was your book, right? Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting story. I'll bring you right up to date. Um, I don't know. My letter agent said, hey, Mark, you're crazy when I said I was going to write a letter to the New York District Attorney's Office asking him to investigate um, Dorothy Kilgallen's death 52 years later because there was no investigation in 1965. People were scared to come forward in 65. That's what I've learned. People have even uh, been scared to talk to me now, 52 years later, for whatever reason, including family members. But they were scared because here's what they thought. Uh, We know Dorothy was working on the JFK assassination. Well, uh, logically, that's why they killed her. And if those same people killed JFK and then killed Dorothy, well, we're not about to come forward So none of her family, none of her What's My Line colleagues, none of the newspaper people, nobody came forward. They just let it go, which is a real, you know, stain on their reputations. Well, I sent this letter to Cyrus Vance Jr., and lo and behold, the New York Post in January published an article saying that they were going to uh, look into and then investigate Dorothy Kilgallen's death. And I will tell you how... Uh, that her name is still magic because the reporter, Sue Edelman, told me that that online article, there were 235,000 hits. And that didn't even count the print edition. So there were many people interested in what Dorothy would do. So uh, the director of communications there set me up with the um, uh, an email uh, you know, trail that we could use. And I then started sending them 
they'd already uh, told me that the book had been written uh, been read and that they'd looked at some video uh, I'd sent them and and some uh, audio tapes and pataki information all of that so they knew all about that well all this new evidence started coming into me Eric and so I would send that back to Joan this director of communications and she was going to filter it to the chief investigator in the DA's office that went on for January, February, all the way down until June when I was making a trip to New York City because I had located Dorothy Kilgallen's butler, James Clement's daughter, Brenda. And I could never find her before I wrote the book. So I said, I want to talk to the, I want to talk to the assistant district attorney involved in Dorothy's death and the chief investigator. And Joan finally set up a meeting, and in, on June the uh, 2nd uh, of this year, I sat with the detective uh, Richard Ramos, a former homicide detective, assigned to Dorothy's case. And he was just overflowing with how pleased he was to be involved in the case and called Dorothy a victim, and um, he'd already sent out subpoenas, and he'd read my book, and he'd looked at all the videos at the DorothyKilgallenStory.org. He was convinced she was the reporter who knew too much, and he was so excited, and I gave him a 22-page evidence report with 25 witnesses in there that needed to be interviewed, all of these documents now that I knew existed through uh, some research that I had. He was just ecstatic, and everything then went forward with June, July, and August. Uh, He and I became uh, email buddies, and how appreciative he was of all the work I was doing and all these other kind of things that were going on. So we get to August, and he tells me that he wants to have a telephone conversation with me and the assistant district attorney, Gene Hurley, and to update the investigation. And so we have this telephone call, and I'm expecting them to tell me, I mean, I'm hoping that they're going to say, look, we've, we've really looked into this thoroughly, we've really gone forward, and we believe that, yes, Dorothy Kilgallen was, uh, was uh, killed, uh, we're, we we can't tell maybe who did it, but at least we know that. So I'm expecting that news, and then I hear, hear this Gene Hurley say, "Listen, Mark, we really can't find we find no evidence that Dorothy was harmed by the actions of another." And I said, "What?" And he said, "Yes." And I said, "Well, listen, who have you interviewed? I can't tell you that." Well, did you talk to Ron Patak? I can't tell you that four or five, six times. I can't tell you that. At one point, he finally said to me, you know, Mr. Shaw, I can't argue with this. We're going we're gonna to stop the investigation, and we're not going any further with it. And in fact, we can't tell who did it. And I said, what? I said, you just told me that she wasn't harmed by anybody, and now you're telling me uh, you can't tell who did it. Those, those two comments don't make any sense. And he said, listen, um, we're, we're going to close the investigation, and then abruptly the conversation was over. So I heard that news, and uh, again, I'm a curious person like you are and suspicious, too. And so I got to thinking, was this really, because he said it was a really thorough investigation. And I thought, I wonder if they talked to any of these witnesses. So I sent out four or five emails to very critical witnesses. One, Eric, who had been at a 1970s dinner where uh, Dorothy's daughter Jill was, and said that Jill had told had told the people there my mother was murdered. I had a confirmation of that from the uh, from the uh, from Kilgallen's butler's daughter. There were other witnesses in there that that really uh, uh, a toxicologist at the medical examiner's office. Well, they wrote me right back and said we'd never been contacted. I looked at all of the witnesses I had given them. I can only find one that they interviewed. So I just decided to write another letter to Cyrus Vance Jr. and say, look, this was not in any way a thorough investigation. It has denied Dorothy justice again. Do something about this. You you know that this was a false statement that was made uh, regarding this investigation because they had told the, the New York Post, who published a small short article about it, this is all, this is all uh, uh, you know, denying Dorothy the justice that she deserves again. And uh, I didn't get any answer to that, so I did the only thing that I could do, and that was file a Freedom of Information request, uh, asking for all the witness statements and documents, knowing that they don't really have any witness statements in my belief, but trying to pin them down as to what happened. Well, that was denied. So the next step, and I won't give up, uh, Eric, just like you wouldn't, 
uh, I filed an appeal, and I'm, I'm filing an appeal, and it's a 12-page letter uh, to the hearing officer, who unfortunately, of course, works for the DA's office, but it sets out everything start to finish, and that will be filed Monday. And there is an organization in New York City, or New York, called uh, Committee for Good Government, and they've gotten involved in this because they see the absurdity of the fact that the DA killed this investigation when it wasn't any way, shape, or form thorough. So I'll file that. I don't know whether we'll have any good fortune with it, but the next step then will be the courtroom. And I'm just going to keep after this. Uh, those people who have heard about the fact that they closed the investigation are furious, all of her supporters and all of that. And so I'm going to keep after this. But again, once again, we, we seem to have a cover-up like we had in 1965 and then again in 1968. Um, for whatever reason, people are scared to death of Dorothy Kilgallen and her JFK assassination and anything about her death. And maybe that's why some of the national media um, won't focus on Dorothy. There's just something there that I can't figure out because we're 52 years later uh, and Dorothy Kilgallen uh, should get the, Dor uh, the, the justice she deserves and I'm going to keep fighting for that to happen. I'm sure it's pure speculation, but what do you think are the real reasons on why this thing isn't moving forward? I don't know that it's, it's pure speculation based on one of my theories. It could have been too expensive. It could have been taking too long. They wanted to use uh, Detective Ramos on something else. It could be something like that. But one of the things that Dorothy Kilgallen's butler's daughter told me that her father related to her was the fact that between the time the body was found in the morning and when the police came, government agents, FBI agents, were in that townhouse carrying carrying Dorothy Kilgallen's documents and papers away in several boxes. This JFK assassination file, this thick file that she had, was uh, disappeared and was never found. They believe that her husband had it, but I think my new evidences show that that wasn't the case. So my belief is that whether uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI were directly involved in Dorothy Kilgallen's death, if they weren't, then when Hoover found out she was dead, he sent his agents in there looking for one thing. What was that? The JFK file. My hope has always been that that JFK file that she had, her investigation file, is in the FBI files. I filed Freedom of Information Acts with the FBI. I've never gotten it, but I've always felt it was there. So whether it was corruption among the New York Police Department, the medical examiner's office, or the fact that the FBI could put pressure on the DA's office somewhere or another to not release any of those documents, I have a feeling that's what's behind this. And uh, it, it's not speculation because they were aware of all this evidence, including um, you know, the, the, the Butler daughters uh, um, telling me about the, the FBI being there, so the mystery just continues, you know, it's, it's the mysterious death of Dorothy Kilgallen. Well, it just continues on because now this has happened and um, I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll see what happens with the appeal, but I guarantee you every single thing that I put in this appeal letter, I got all the emails from Detective Ramos and um, from uh, the director of communication at the DA's office, all of that will be in the new book along with all of the new evidence that I've found, and then people can make up their own mind. But I'm hoping, just hoping, maybe I'm too optimistic, Eric, that when uh, they they see this appeal letter, this, this um, appeals officer sees this letter, and when the Committee on Good Government sees it, that something's going to happen there, and they're going to decide, look, this wasn't a thorough investigation, and they'll reopen the investigation. That's my greatest hope right now. Well, what do you think Hoover's motivation was for covering this all up? Well, what would have scared J. Edgar Hoover and Carlos Marcello and the other mobsters who may have been involved is a grand jury investigation. And uh, Dorothy had it all. I mean, that's just a, that quote. It's coming back to me because that's what uh, one of the hairdressers says in one of those videotaped interviews at the Dorothy Kilgallen story dot org. She had it all. They knew she had it all. She was telling everybody she had it all. And here is Marcello and Hoover uh, watching from afar, and here's the one thorn in their side. You know, conveniently, uh, Oswald is arrested right after, and Hoover says Oswald, Oswald alone. Now you have Ruby, 
um, you know, uh, conveniently killing Oswald. And I can tell you as well, a, a reader, a lawyer down in Fresno, California, was kind enough to get in touch with me. And he has provided me and given me the permission to use the 2,000-page Jack Ruby trial testimony. Never been published before. And I've gone through it. took me about eight days, and I found information in there about Ruby that made no sense whatsoever in terms of his just accidentally being in the Dallas Police Department basement uh, that morning when he killed Oswald. Makes no sense at all. But Oswald is now dead. Now you have Ruby. And you bring in Melvin Belli, the mafia... Uh, affiliated lawyer, and he comes up with this ludicrous defense that makes Ruby look like he's crazy, won't let Ruby testify. So now Ruby is is uh, basically a lost cause. There's only one person out there who's shouting, hey, this doesn't, all this doesn't make sense, and that's Dorothy Kilgallen. And so, in my opinion, there's there's no question whatsoever that they could not let her write that book. They could not let her write that book, and so one way or another, she had to be silenced. Well, this has been excellent, and your book, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, is available pretty much everywhere, right? It is, and um, you know, uh, again, you know, it's you know, it's not about selling books for me. Uh, I, I'm pleased that it's it's become a bestseller, but it's about more and more people, and I think at last count, some twenty some thousand. Uh, Books have been sold, and it's still in libraries, and it's on Amazon, and it's all in the bookstores, the paperback, everywhere. It's about all of these people finally learning about Dorothy Kilgallen, and I'm going to keep shouting. You know, I uh, probably, I think in the last count, maybe more than 100 media interviews about Dorothy when the book came out, and, and I continue to have those. And people like you, who are people of the truth, um, I appreciate so much your having me on the program. And I do want to say, Eric, if there's anybody who listens to your popular uh, podcast and and uh, as you know I'm I'm an admirer of yours now uh, uh, with with what you've been able to do and you're and you're being an author yourself and all of that if there's anybody out there and there are many people who are still alive and you never know uh, what they might know about Dorothy Kilgallen's case I had a librarian in Illinois for instance uh who who told me about a woman that was at a at a uh, meeting there, and and they were talking about the JFK assassination, and Dorothy Kilgallen's name came up, and she said, "You know, I waited on her uh, the last night at PG, PGA Clark's, and she was talking about the the JFK assassination." So, if somebody knows anything, if they'll let me know, because I continue to try to build a case with new evidence, whatever, uh, that will compel this investigation to be reopened. And the case is still recent enough, as you've mentioned, that there might very well be people out there who have some real first-hand knowledge of what really happened. Well, I think there are. And uh, again, I'm looking for primary witnesses, not somebody told somebody told somebody. I'm looking for people that, you know, have eyewitness testimony and and can provide facts that are credible uh, because that's what Dorothy would do. That's what I've tried to do with this book is to be her voice and to... um, you know, act in a way like Dorothy would act. If Dorothy Kilgallen would have gone after this particular death, let me tell you, um, things would have changed because she would have gotten to the bottom of this, whether she was scared or not. She was fearless. She was a, you know, basically she put a a target on her back, um, believing that she was invincible, but unfortunately, uh, obviously she wasn't. One more question. What do you think it is about Dorothy Kilgallen that's struck such a chord with your readers? Because people have become obsessed with her her life and death, in large part because of your book. People have called her a patriot. They've called her a hero. There's a woman who went to her uh, to the um, funeral, uh, to the cemetery, where she's buried and brushed away the leaves and put flowers there. What is it? Um, I'm kind of getting a, a chill there. I, I just think that... Uh, you know, what Dorothy stood for, integrity, of course, but a woman of the truth and fighting so hard to, we can't even imagine her overcoming the barriers that she had to overcome to get to the uh, position of power that she had. And yet she was fair-minded. Um, yeah, with, with somebody like Sinatra, she was tough on him, but there are some later columns where she praised his abilities, his his skill, his gifts as a a singer. She was fair-minded, 
And the other thing I would say, Dorothy would have never been interested in any fake news. She would have uh, abhorred that. Uh, today, that happens so much, unfortunately, Eric, and Dorothy wasn't like that. So I I would um, sum it all up in, in one word, respect. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I, I appreciate it very much. My guest again has been Mark Shaw, author of The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, The Mysterious Death of What's My Line TV star and media icon Dorothy Kilgallen. This has been another episode of the most notorious podcast broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Riminus, and have a safe tomorrow.